life is full of happiness, of joy. All of us experience this. But what happens when it all fades away? What happens when joy is replaced by trials, tribulations, and storms? How do we find our way back? We're wrapping up our series on how to be happy in an unhappy world. We've been talking about it for the last uh, three weeks, and today, uh, even if today's not good, it'll be brief, okay? So, uh, because today I'm just going to try to sort of put an exclamation point on everything we've been talking about, just to give you a little quick, quick recap. The the first week, we, we... we said that happiness is always tied to a, a who or a group of who's, not a what, right? Because if your happiness is tied to a what, then we're always looking for what's next or what's new or what else. If, if, that, if it takes a what to make you happy, we're always looking for that next what, that next high, that next thing we get that's going to make us temporarily happy. But a real genuine uh, happiness and joy and peace is tied to a who or a group of who. If you don't believe it, talk to someone who's, who's lost a significant who in their life. And, and they'll, they'll tell you, I would give up all my what's to have another day with my who, right? Who's are what matters in our life. When, when we get to our last days, we said we wouldn't be sitting around asking the nurse to bring all of our shoes to our bedside so we could just feel them and look at them. We won't ask them to roll us out and sit us in our car because we just want to sit in this car one more time. We're going to want the who's in our life around our bedside. We're going to be thinking about the who's that maybe we wasted time and didn't get to see them. So then in the second lesson, we said that happy people are people who are at peace. They're at peace with themselves. They're at peace with others. And they're at peace with God. If you're not at peace, you're not going to be happy. Happiness is tied to your peace. And the scripture tells us, God said, I'll keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind on me. Not on what somebody said about you or what you think you heard somebody do or not what's going on in somebody else's life. Keep your mind on me and I'll keep you in perfect peace. And guess what? You're going to be a happier person. And then last week, we, we looked at what's called the Beatitudes or the Blessings And Jesus gave us eight of these beatitudes or eight strategies of how to be happy, how to be blessed, how to be happy. And most of these are tied in to happiness comes from doing the right thing every time, striving to do what's right every time, and you stay happy. Because when you're unhappy, normally it's because we did the wrong thing, isn't it? When we do the wrong thing, it brings unhappiness. Well, today we're going to play with that old adage of money can't buy you happiness. Now, we're uh, going through a Dave Ramsey course right now. I told Maurice earlier, I said, I feel a little inadequate to even talking about money when you've been listening to Dave Ramsey. Uh, But I'm going to play with that adage. I want us to look at that of money can't buy you happiness. Whoever first said that probably never had much money. Right? Because we know that money can indeed buy you happiness, at least temporarily. You buy a new car, you're happy. You run it in a ditch, not so happy anymore. But money can buy you happiness. Some people say it can, some people say it can't. I know many of you are thinking maybe it can, maybe it can't, but I'd sure like to give it a try. Right? I'd like to give that thing a try. Me too. 
That's, that's evident by the millions of people who, who buy lotto tickets or go to the casinos or, or work all the time trying to get money, trying to, because we're looking for money because we think, you know, if I can get that money, that's going to feel something in me that's missing. It's going to, you know, it's going to make me happy. And, and I, I assure you it can. Um, money can buy you happiness. You've heard me talk for the last few weeks about that country song. It says, they say money can't buy you happiness, but it can buy me a boat. You know, and so that, that boat makes me happy for a little while. Uh, the problem with boats and iPhones and iPads and Xboxes and clothes and toys and cars and just about everything else is everything money can buy gets old and gets outdated. Before we even learn how to really use our iPhone, they've already got another one out, right? That's got one more feature than the one we have, so we got to have this one. Now they've got iWatches, iPhone watches, right? And I'm sure they're selling, I got a Fitbit. They've got that for Christmas. Tells me how many steps I've taken every day, how many calories I burn, how many hours I sleep at night. Tells you all these great things and a lot of useless information. And they've probably got a Fitbit 2 now that does one more thing than my Fitbit 1 because these marketers are not dummies. And so you have to upgrade to the Fitbit 2. Um, so if money can buy happiness then I have to ask, how much money would it take to make you happy? Don't answer me out loud, but think about it. How much money would it take to... And the funny thing about this question is, is if I ask this question across the board, doesn't matter if you're asking it to the poor or, or what, who you may consider lower class or middle class or lower middle or upper middle or upper class. It doesn't matter who, you, who you're talking to. In some variation or another, the answer is still going to be more than I currently have now. How much money will it take to make you happy? A little bit more. One of the richest men in the world, they said, was asked the question, at what point do you reach that level of just being happy? And, you know, how much does it take to make you happy? And his answer was, just a little bit more. If I can just get a little bit more, I'll be happy. And see, the problem is, yes, money can buy you happiness. What it can't buy is lasting happiness and joy and contentment and peace, no matter how much of it you acquire. It doesn't matter how much you get, it can't buy you lasting joy, peace, and happiness. Um, I, I, I can prove it. We can all look at, at some people who have lots and lots of money, and yet you can see that they're not happy. Many are not happy in their marriages. They're not happy with their kids. They're not happy in their business. They're not happy in their life. And then you can find folks who have less than we do and, and that, that seem just genuinely happy and at peace. And so we, we know that it's not the money that's controlling these things. Uh, while, while money may dictate temporary happiness, it cannot control lasting happiness and joy and peace. Money or the lack of money. Um, we said a few weeks ago, you take someone who has very little when it comes to material things, they may be sitting there on a, on a 20-year-old sofa with springs popping out of it and watching a little black and white TV with rabbit ears and tinfoil on them and eating a tuna fish sandwich, but, but, but they're just, hey, it's amazing the things that doesn't bother these people. They, they, they have things that, that just annoys the rest of us and they just like, don't even, you know, don't bother me. I don't really care what the stock market does. Doesn't bother me if it fell 100 points. It's the way I am. Stock markets don't bother me. If you don't have any money in them, it don't matter. See, what, what, what happened? You remember, I've shared this little story many times, but, but remember the, the old man lived in the country all of his life, and his daughter goes and gets him and picks him up and brings him to the big city, takes him to the mall, three-story mall with escalators running up around him, takes him there. All day they spend there at this mall, and they get through, and they're going home. And she says, Dad, what would you think about that mall? He says, amazing. Never have I seen so many things in one place I could do without. 
That's contentment. Never have I seen so many things in one place I could do without. See, the enemy will try to substitute happiness with pleasure. He'll sell you pleasure, causing you to think you've purchased happiness. What you've got is a little bit of pleasure. How many of you have ever made an impulse buy? An impulse buy. People, you need to understand what's in Walmart. They don't just throw that stuff on shelves and let it land where it lands. Everything is in a specific place for a specific reason. The things when you're standing in the long lines, because Walmart has 30 checkout places but three cashiers. It's another sermon for another day. But you're in a long line, and they've got the shelves of things, and you think, huh, that looks good. Yeah. Chewy nut bar. I'm a little hungry. You know, right there, bag, bag of chips. I ain't tried those chips. That's cheddar brand. And you're standing and you got all this time with nothing to do, so you're just looking there. You can't help but look. I mean, stuff's right there. And they put stuff on the ends of the aisle that has everything is specific because they're, they're selling you. So we make these impulse buys. Men, we go into Lowe's or Home Depot. We see his tool. We didn't even know they made such a thing. A, a portable concrete saw. Wow. That thing's on sale for $4.99. I better get that. And we get it and bring it home, put it next to our other 50 tools. We walk out one day and we think, I don't know if I'm ever going to want to divide my driveway in half. You know? I, just, I, don't, I can't see myself cutting the garage off my house. Why would I buy that anyway? That was the dumbest thing I've ever bought. But something about it then, man, I've got to have that. I mean, if I ever do get ready to, to cut some concrete, I'm, I'm ready. Or women go and buy, you know, they see these shoes. And we know we've already got five pair of black shoes at home, but these have this one little strap, and wow. And so we, we buy them. And we come home and we tell your husband how much money you saved on these things. And sit them on the shelf next to your other black ones, which you really like more anyway. And, you sit, and one day you go in and you pull them out of the box that they've never been out of and say, that wasn't very smart. Because we do that. We make these impulse buys. And um, our, our, one of my favorites is we stand, and because this one, this one is, uh, this is my confessional time. We stand in front of our giant walk-in closet. Listen, I've got a big walk-in closet in my bedroom, and then one of the spare bedrooms is a walk-in closet. And I'm not kidding. That's all that's in there. It's clothes from wall to wall. It's got racks that I had built, racks that hold clothes. I have a sinful amount of clothes. I, I do. It's, I'm, I, it's honest. And the worst part is, you know, when Tick calls and says you got to wear a suit, and I go in there and say, I don't have nothing to wear. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe I need to run out and pick up a new tie or something, you know? I won't even. T Never mind. Money, money can make you do really stupid things and make stupid decisions. One, one of the things that, that Dave Ramsey has been saying is, is we start thinking we can out-earn our stupidness. If I just make a little bit more money, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be okay. All I need is a little bit more money, and, and I'll be happy, and, and that'll cure my stupidness. And all it does is, is more money only enhances our stupidness, right? The more money we get, the stupider we get with it. We, we, buy, we buy bigger and better, more stupid things. So we use shopping and other things to try and buy our happiness. I'm depressed, so I'm going shopping. I'm depressed, so I'm going golfing. Or I'm going this. I'm not happy, so I'm going to the casino so I can be less happy in a little bit when I leave and I've lost more money. <laughs> Pleasure is no substitute for happiness. Money is an awesome tool. Money is a wonderful thing. It allows us to do so many wonderful things. It does allow us to feed people and allows us to reach out and, and, and bless our families and bless other people and, and 
all of these things. But when the enemy tricks us into thinking that money is the key to pleasure and pleasure is the key to happiness, he just set you up for some major failure, some major depression and unhappiness in your life. Now, here's one of the quickest and easiest ways to break free of the grip that money has on you. This is a simple little deal. It's, a, it's an old, old recipe, but it still works today. I began teaching my girls this a long time ago, and, and uh, it, it really is just, it works off give, save, and manage. I, I like to use this for a rule. This may not be where you end up. In fact, I hope it's not where you end up, but it's a great place to start what I call the 10 10 80 plan. And, and it, it simply says when you get your paycheck, uh, immediately you give 10% back to God. And that's not entirely accurate because I said you give 10%. The Bible, you know the Bible never instructs you to give 10% as a tithe? The Bible never instructs you to give a tithe at all. Because to give something implies it's yours and you gave it away. The Bible never says to give a tithe. The Bible says bring the tithe into the storehouse. And he said if you do not bring the tithe into the storehouse, God said you rob me of what's mine because the tithe doesn't belong to you. It belongs to me. And if you keep in what belongs to me, you're robbing me of the tithe. The tithe belongs to God. It's a starting point. It says it's not mine, it's yours. So I bring the 10% back into the storehouse so that we can reach out, so that we can do things. The second 10%, I pay myself. The second 10%, I put into a long-term savings account, not to be confused with what I call a delayed spending account. Right? You put it in savings but then by the end of the month, you got to pull it out and put it in checking because the money has run out before the month has. That's a delayed spending account. But put it into a savings account where it stays there, 10%. And then you learn how to live and manage the other 80%. And it's called a 10 10 80 plan. And it works. And, you know, if you can figure out uh, and understand that it's, it's easier to live on uh, 90% or 80% of your income that's blessed by God than on 100% that's cursed. Um, so, so, so this, what this really does is it says to the enemy that I'm not going to be ruled by the love of money. I'm just not going to be. Jesus said the love or the lust for money is the root of all evil. And you think about it. You know, so many times there's that little adage that says, follow the money. Follow the money. You want to catch this guy? Follow the money. You want to see who did this? Follow the money. You want to see who killed them? Look who's on the life insurance. You know, follow the money. Follow the money. Follow the money. He says the root of all evil. And this just says to the enemy, I'm not going to be controlled by the love or the lust of money. And so, so you're breaking that chain that the enemy has on you concerning your finances, that little lie that a little bit more and I'll be happy. Just a little bit more and that's all, I'll be satisfied. That's all I need. No, give, save, and manage. So that's one way to begin achieving true, lasting happiness in your life. In, in, instead of your money controlling you, suddenly you control your money. And there's a big difference in you controlling your money and your money controlling you. Too many of us, our money controls us. It dictates what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. And so let me just wind up by saying this, that we are in this, this small group right now called Financial Peace University. If you didn't make it into this one, because we're three into it now, uh, we'll be doing another one. This is, a, this is a series I'd like to do, you know, a couple of times a year anyway because it's, it's a fantastic class and course that we do it in between services here, um, about 45 minutes to an hour, but it's a really, 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 doesn't matter where you are on the financial scale or whether you're single or married, young or old, it's just a great, great class. Uh, so money, can it buy happiness? Yes. Can it buy true, lasting happiness, joy, and peace? Never, no matter how much of it you acquire. Happiness is tied to a who or a group of who's, not a what. 
not a what. The easiest way to break that chain is just to begin to, to release it. Happiness is always tied to peace. If you really want to be happy in your life, you've got to find a way to get some peace. How do I do that? Get your mind on Jesus. I'll keep him in perfect peace who keeps her mind on me. Some of you just need to get your mind off of other stuff. You need to get your mind off what somebody did to you. You need to get your mind off what somebody else has that you think you have to have. A neighbor, he got a concrete saw. (laughs) Borrow his. Right? You've heard me say this. Nothing will depreciate the value of your automobile quicker than your neighbor getting a new one. (laughs) Yesterday, you loved your car. You call it old Betsy and you've had it paid for and that thing ran good. Then your neighbor comes up with one and oh my gosh. You wonder how you got home. <laughs> I don't know how it made it home. This thing is falling apart. I mean, I've had to, you know, had to put a new battery in it. I only had to think 20 years. I had to put a battery in it just the other day. Get your mind off what everybody else has or don't have. Put your mind on God. Begin to be thankful for what God's blessed you with. Go back and read Matthew chapter 5, those Beatitudes, those things that he says blessed or happy is the person who does this. And then go do it. I mean, it's it's Jesus' recipe for how to be happy in an unhappy world. Blessed are these people that do this. And then realize that money, don't fall into that trap that all I need is a little bit more money and I'll be happy. It's just not true. You'll be happy for a short period of time and then you're going to be sad because it doesn't matter how much you acquire. I like to say this little thing when you see your neighbor's car. Learn to admire without having to acquire. Learn to be grateful when other people are being blessed and other people are doing it. You just thankful, bless them. God, thank you. Lord, I'm so happy for them. But I don't have to have one a little bit bigger and a little bit better. This one's just fine. Amen. Amen. Thank you so very much for joining us here today at Church in the Rock. Today's message has been a part of Roger's series, Finding Lasting Happiness in an Unhappy World. We pray that throughout this series that you learn how to cope with the different negative situations that life throws at us. Now, if this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusTheRock.org. There you can look at our latest podcast, tell us how this series touches you, or give to our ministries financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Have a blessed day.